Hi, so I'm here with Rachel Bernstein. Um, I happen to be visiting Los Angeles and took advantage of that fact to uh, meet up with Rachel in person. We've done um, Google Hangout interviews in the past, and if you haven't seen those, I encourage you to do so because we talk about what a destructive cult or a high control group or mass movement, however, whatever term you want to use for that, we talk about what those are and uh, how they work and uh, the various control mechanisms and things that they use in order to wrangle people in and get them involved and keep them involved. We went over quite a bit of details about that. Mm -hmm. And we also covered your own run-in with Scientology, specifically. Yes. yes, we did. And that whole history, and that was a lot mm -hmm. of fun. <laughs> uh, not. <laughs> very, very nice of you to, uh, to give me your time on this. Pleasure. Yep, so thank you. Sure. And um, so we're going to talk now about uh, more about uh, destructive cults and specifically how does one go about relating to, you know, if a friend or a relation or a loved one is, is involved in a group like this, what do you do? How do you relate to them? How do you communicate to them? What do you do? What do you not do? And also, um, you know, how do you go about, if you really want to take the plunge and really go for it, how do you go about getting somebody out of a group like that? Um, because it's not something they'll necessarily do on their own, um, you know, but if you, you know, botch it, then you could make it so that the person believes even more and even and has to stay even more fervently involved. First off, um, we did a whole video on what a destructive cult is, but just in a sentence or two, what, what do you understand that term to mean? How do you describe that to, to patients, clients you have? Right, so it's a good question because when you're talking about a destructive cult, you're talking about something other than the dictionary definition of a cult, mm -hmm. uh, which cults will often say, just look up the word cult in the dictionary and you won't see anything bad, as, as somehow that's going to solve the problem and answer the question. It doesn't, because really what you're talking about is a group that is destructive, a group that's dangerous. And so the definition of that is where there is uh, unquestioning loyalty and unquestioning devotion to the leader and to all of the teaching so that the leader has to be seen as omniscient, omnipotent, above other people. Um, then you have a group that at its very core is deceptive where they will say one thing and do another and say they really stand for something and that they're going to be furthering certain goals but you find out that they really don't have that ability or that true intention um, and they really just want you to be involved and want you to be devoted to them uh, or they want you to help them line their pockets with cash. Um, it's also often led by someone who is not well uh, either by virtue of being psychotic and believing in some things that are um, not necessarily within kind of the framework of mental health. Um, and that can be destructive because if, for example, like the group in San Diego, Heaven's Gate, if the leader believes that the mothership is coming behind a comet and that everyone needs to leave their bodies and go to the mothership, everyone commits suicide. And then you have the kind of leader who really knows what he or she is up to and has been schooled in and has studied mind control and techniques of influence um, and how to take people over. And they love the power of it and will use you to feed their ego. And you did not have the opportunity to make an educated decision. That's the other part. Within a healthy organization, or a healthy fringe movement, or even cult as the way the dictionary defines cult, you can do your research, and you can go on the internet, and you can talk to former members, and you can find out what the group is really about um, before getting involved, and also while you're involved. But within a destructive cult, you're never allowed to do that. And in fact, they'll make you feel that something terrible will happen to you if you do seek out that information, because it truly threatens them. Fair enough. And, uh, and again, we covered this in much more detail in an earlier video, which I would encourage you to look at uh, if you haven't yet seen that. So now, let's say that you have a person um, that you know, 
Mm -hmm. right? Either a friend or a loved one or a relation or something who gets involved in one of these groups. They get sucked in, right? Um, what do you do as a friend or a family member with such a person? How do you deal with that? Do you, you know, oh my God, will you what? You know, is that, should that be your reaction or what should you? No. <laughs> okay, so, so what should you, what should you do in, in um, such a case? Right. So instead of doing that, uh, let me just say that that's human nature to mm -hmm. say what, or haven't you heard about this group? Um, and a lot of family and friends feel like they've blown it. And over the course of a couple decades, I've run groups for families and friends who have loved ones in cults. So I've been asked this question quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, by the time people come to the group, they feel like they've blown it. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that's very, very important to do is first of all, to really do your research and not just be very reactionary about just hearing the name of that group. Find out what you're up against. Find out what your loved one has gotten involved with and involved in. And maybe if you really have the time and the inclination, and I think it's wise, you want to not only do your research, but talk to people who have left it to find out why they did. Mm -hmm. and, and also how they were able to get out. There's a lot of information now that people can access, uh, which is really wonderful. I, I know when we spoke with um, Joe Zimhart on, a, on our podcast, he mentioned the idea when you're relating to a person who's in a group like this, to get them to tell you about it. Mm -hmm. And that's probably, I'm sort of thinking as we're talking right now, that that might be a good initial reaction mm -hmm. uh, when you're, you know, hey, I just got involved, you know, I, I'm a Scientologist now, right? right? Instead of saying, oh my God, that you mean you, you believe in space aliens? right exactly. uh, or you know something else equally off-putting instead simply say oh and you know again this is sort of like you know I, forewarned I guess but like um, oh well what, what have you done mm -hmm. with it mm -hmm. oh what, what is it about that 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 you know you, you certainly you've seen in the media you know mm -hmm. some things about that what do you think about that you know try right. to keep a positive very yes. and information gathering mm -hmm. sort of yes yeah, so what I try to tell people to do is to uh, be as calm as possible and also to be wondering out loud hmm I wonder what that's about and what mm -hmm. your experience has been like and can you teach me you are not the expert necessarily in that conversation that's not going to go over well if you come across as knowing more um, you want to, whether or not you feel that you do know more, and chances are, being outside the group, you know much more about it that's true and real uh, and accurate than people in it. But you don't want to come across that way. You don't want to come across as really talking down to the person and like somehow you just don't get it, I have the information, you don't. That is not a good angle. Um, and so to say, oh, I've heard about that group, I'm really wondering about it, can you tell me what your experience has been like, can you tell me what the philosophy is, or what the technology is, or what the belief system is, who have you met there, what has your experience been like, and just gather information. The reason you also want to gather information is that it gives you insight into what seems to be working for that person who you love, why it is that they're involved in it. Because if the first thing they say is, oh, well, I feel like I've really made a lot of good friends and I have a new community, and that that's top of their list, then that gives you a sense of understanding about what it is that's really working for them in that group and why it is that they were attracted to it and that that's probably more important than even the belief system. Um, so you also then have to be sure that no matter what they say, you don't say, oh, how could you believe that? Um, or do you really think it's worth it to sacrifice everything for this? You don't question it, you just take in the information. And then you set up a time to talk again about it. So that really you let them know this is just the beginning of your conversations together. Um, one of the reasons that you want to stay positive is that cults will want to demonize you. If you are someone who has any influence over this person and is not a member of it, 
and doesn't seem to be interested in becoming a member of it, it's going to be very easy for the cult to encourage that person to cut off communication with you. And it's going to be even easier for the person to want to do it if you're at all negative, if you're at all critical. So you don't want to fall into that trap. And you can kind of out manipulate the manipulators by being positive because they're not expecting that. And so then if you're not a threat, this person can continue talking to you or can continue visiting you at your house or coming for a holiday or whatever else because you know you haven't said anything bad. When a cult also talks about the world and talks about life in general, it's a very black and white way of thinking for the most part. So it's very easy for you to go to the dark side um, and never to return. Uh, in the cult's eyes and in that member's eyes, at least not for a long time. So again, you don't want to fall into that trap. It is also very good to ask yourself a couple of questions before you want to go ahead and talk to the person involved in the group. You want to remember sort of the who, what, when, where, and why questions. If it's a family system or if it's a group of friends, who would be the best person to bring up the conversation? Typically someone who that person has a very comfortable and safe feeling kind of relationship with. Um, sometimes a sibling rather than a parent. Because a parent might trigger certain feelings of defensiveness where the child has to prove that they've made the best decision. Um, and also which friend is least confrontative. Uh, and that would be the friend who would approach them first. Um, what what is what you bring up and what you really want to try to get across like this is something that if this is important to the person who you like or love it's important to you to really know about it um, and when timing plays a huge role in the success of any kind of conversation um, and so pick the timing well if they're going through a particularly hard time that's not the time to have a conversation that might be difficult. Um, and you'll know that person well enough to know when might be a better time than another time. Um, and I think where also. If you're mm -hmm. going to have this conversation in um, a forum where they're with other members from the group, it's not really going to go well. Mm -mm. So you want to see if you can get them aside you know, it could, you could even take them on a walk somewhere. Um, sometimes if you're sitting down having a conversation, it feels a little more like an interrogation. Uh, and so doing an activity together, and then you just happen to bring this up, so it feels like it was sort of an afterthought, is a nice way to do it. But again, to try to get them alone if possible. I know it's not always possible, but that's something that, you know, you can call me about and we can figure out ways to make it possible. And then why? Why are you bringing this up? Make sure you make that clear. That it's not to question them, it's not to doubt them, it's not to criticize them. It's because you care. It's because you love them. And they're doing something that you don't know a lot about and you'd like to know more. So now let's say that um, you have blown it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You didn't know what we just talked about, you don't know these things, and you reacted to what the person Mm -hmm. said or did or you've pissed them off somehow or you've created an upset an all too common occurrence in regards to this thing because people get pretty passionate about this sort of thing yeah. especially you know with some of these more um, I don't know well known or mainstream or more you know known about groups like Scientology or the Kabbalah something like that where mm -hmm. you know you just go oh god that's such a cult you know, I, what, you're a cult member now, you know, and this sort of thing, mm -hmm. and you've instantly, like, right. alienated them. Yep. Now, what do you do? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so the information that I'm about to tell you is actually something that you can use when you're dealing with uh, a situation having to do with a cult, or even a marital issue, an issue with your kids in general, uh, whatever the situation. You want to figure out a way to come back from the bad experience and try to start fresh and try to start clean. So one of the ways you do that is you apologize a lot. 
and you go up to the person and sometimes they will have cut off from you so you try different ways of reaching them and sometimes you can then give them a, uh, a message through a friend or somebody else um, where they might be still taking their calls or be open to seeing this other person. Um, and you say to them something like the following, and there are a lot of different choices, but it's basically this message. I blew it. I am so sorry. I didn't know what I was up against. The whole idea scared me. It was something very different. It's something that can make anyone a bit panicked if they feel like something bad might happen and they're not going to be able to control it. And I was feeling a bit out of control in the situation and that came across. So it doesn't have to do with you, it had to do with me. So in that way you own it. This was, this was my, you know, my bad, <laughs> I did this, sorry about that. And can I get another chance? because I would love for us to have the kind of rapport where you feel like you get another chance and I get another chance. And if you give me another chance, then I know that I'm gonna handle it differently. And also that if you feel like I'm saying something that you don't like, then let's, before we even get into the subject at hand, let's do something that I call talking about talking. Let's have a conversation where we talk about how to talk about this. What questions are okay to ask? What questions are not okay to ask? Um, I'm gonna try to be careful about my tone. And if you feel like I'm using a tone that feels like I'm questioning you or being patronizing or at all critical, just call me on it. Tell me, don't pack up your things and leave. Uh, sort of teach me school me on the way to talk to you now that would work for you because the whole goal is to keep communication going and so whatever exactly. that takes you yeah because it. once it's cut off that's it it's game over yeah you have zero chance of helping that person anymore if you can't talk to them so right so even an exaggerated you know calm reach out and agreeing to whatever boundaries or rules or whatever they're going mm -hmm. to set mm -hmm. get keeps that communication going right. and then as again in the future you'll get another shot mm -hmm.